Okay, I see it is on and it's 30 past. So welcome everyone. Now we have uh, the people who accessed the lecture for YouTube. Welcome. Uh, so we are the Astronomical Society. We have free lectures every month, every third Thursday of the month. Um, and as you can see, I'm here in company of a few people, We've got members here. And of course, our host, uh, well, our guest, who's going to speak about uh, black holes. Um, just a little uh, forward, we are going to have a Q&A at the end. And we will be looking at the questions on YouTube as well. So if you have a question, feel free to ask. Um, and for people here in the Zoom call, feel free to um, uh, leave a message or uh, asking the question. I can read it out loud or you can ask yourself. Um, but yeah, so um, tonight's talk is kindly sponsored by The Sun. Uh, and by that, I do not mean the, the newspaper. I mean the solar object in our solar system, uh, raising awareness for all suns and stars that do not end up being a black hole. Oh, I think I, I can hear laughter all around Glasgow around me. Thank you very much. Um, and tonight's uh, speaker is Dr. Fabio Biancalana, uh, who's an associate professor at the School of Engineering and Physical Science at the Institute of Photonics and Quantum Sciences at the Henry White University uh, for a very exciting talk with keywords such as truly bizarre, but serious, uh, Hawking radiation, and a culmination of more than 100 years of research on the very enigmatic subject of black holes. So um, I'll let you take over, uh, Dr. Bianca Lana. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Laura. Can you hear me now? Very well, yeah. Yeah, okay, very good. So yeah, so um, this, uh, this talk would be about a, a collection of a few topics, uh, mainly the black hole. Okay, so it is a gentle introduction to general relativity and, uh, and the concept of black hole, which probably you heard many times elsewhere. Okay, uh, but also I want to give um, a kind of flavor about, um, uh, let's say, the very cutting edge research that people are doing on black holes and uh, space time, the structure of space time and other very advanced topics, okay? That you, that let's say the general public uh, rarely can understand in all their significance, okay? So uh, I would like to give a kind of flavor, uh, very, of course, and no mathematical and uh, uh, introduction to these kind of topics. At least you can see let's say, where, what, the range of uh, the variety of uh, topics that people are working on on, this, uh, uh, on black holes. So yeah, this, this image here uh, is a computer simulation of, uh, of uh, the event horizon of a black hole with all the matter rotating around it. This is the image that was taken by the event horizon telescope. It's not a direct photograph, but it's a, uh, kind of reconstructed image. Um, so let's discuss a little bit about theory. So the theory of uh, general relativity, which is basically the theory of gravity, how Albert Einstein thought about uh, the, general, the idea of general relativity. Well, uh, Einstein was uh, a classical physicist. So it was um, remarkable because uh, he just used deductive reasoning to determine that gravity that is a distortion of space-time, which nowadays we take for granted because we heard we, we became familiar with it. But at the time it was something, a concept that was completely alien uh, to normal physics at the time. So it was a real, uh, it was a real breakthrough in the history of, uh, of, of physics, of science. Um, Basically, Einstein uh, started to work on, on, on the theory of gravity in 1905. And it took him 10 years of uh, very intense research until 1915, 
where he basically formulated the theory of general relativity. He managed to formulate in 1915 because uh, uh, one of his colleagues, a uh, uh, very famous mathematician, uh, Hilbert, uh, he actually was following what Einstein was doing during these 10 years. And he almost anticipated Einstein on the, on the final formulation of, uh, of the theory of gravity. So Einstein took this very personally. He almost had a kind of nervous uh, breakdown uh, towards the end. But uh, yeah, finally he managed, to, he managed to, 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 to write the equations of general relativity, so for the theory of gravity. So as we know, uh, gravity is uh, uh, distortion due to distortion of space-time, so masses Large masses distort, distort space time considerably around it. Um, so the crucial idea is can be traced back to the time of Galileo. So when um, the time by when Galileo was basically throwing objects from the Leaning Tower of Pisa. So the main feature of gravity is that all bodies fall with the same acceleration, independent of their mass. This is a, a very, very special thing about gravity that no other force has. Uh, so basically this principle that all bodies fall with the same acceleration took millennia to be recognized as a physical principle until Galileo, probably the real, uh, the, the, the first real physicist in history uh, started to do experiments Okay, real real experiments and using mathematics to 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 study the physical processes. So he determined that all bodies fall with the same acceleration. Okay, the defining principle of gravity that we all know we learn at school. Uh, okay, so in uh, around uh, 1905. Um, Albert Einstein had a similar uh, thought. He thought about this principle, okay? And he came up with, the, with something that we call the equivalence principle nowadays. So let's say that, uh, can you see my pointer? Can you see the pointer? Yeah, you can, okay. So uh, let's say that uh, Albert Einstein is inside um, a lift in space. So there is no gravity. But the lift is accelerating upwards, okay? So any object inside the lift will fall down with the same acceleration, which is the acceleration of the lift that is going upwards, okay? There is no, no gravity, there is no planet. So the accelerated reference frame, the accelerated lift, works exactly like a gravitational field. All bodies fall with the same acceleration. So Einstein thought about this equivalence principle. An accelerated reference frame is identical, it's in indistinguishable from a gravitational field. Okay, so the, this is called the equivalence principle. It seems a very trivial thing, but it is, uh, Einstein was able to, to basically, yeah, what happened there? I can see all kind of drawings. What's going on? Yeah, okay. So what's that? Um somebody's draw is doing stuff on the board. All right, anyway, we're looking into continue. it. Sorry about it. Yeah. We're writing nasty things on the, on the board. Okay, I will continue anyway. So yeah, the, um, there, is in, the, there is this equivalence between accelerated frames and gravitational fields. Okay, this seems trivial, but it's a very deep concept. Okay, and Einstein was able to to, uh, to make many deductions from this. So why this is important? Uh, so imagine that the lift, uh, that you are in space, okay? And the lift is just, uh, has no motion. Then a, a light ray, 
a light ray will go straight, okay? Uh, in a straight uh, trajectory, okay? Along a, a straight trajectory for zero motion. So, uh, Basically, if you have uh, uh, an accelerated lift, okay, the light ray will curve, will go down, okay? Simply because uh, if you imagine the motion frame by frame of the beam of light, the beam of light tends to go along a straight line, but the, um, the lift is accelerating up, okay? So, from a person inside the lift, this will curve, this light ray will curve downwards. And because there is an equivalent between an accelerated frame and gravitational field, Einstein was convinced that the light ray, uh, the ray of light will have to be curved by the gravitational field, okay? Because of the principle of equivalence. So masses, like the sun, big masses, have to curve light, but light is massless. So how is that possible? Because Einstein deduced that it is possible because the gravitational field uh, curves space-time, and therefore light has a curved trajectory. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, the equivalence, uh, the equivalence between gravity and an accelerated frame. So um, basically, the the sun curves the light of far of basically of stars, and therefore, if uh, if uh, the light uh, ray goes very close to the surface of the sun, it will appear to be on a different position. Okay, so the star will appear to be on a different, on, sorry, on a different position. Okay, so light is curved by a big mass like the sun. So these are the equations of general relativity. We don't need to, of course, uh, to be explained here. The curvature tells matter how to move and matter tells space how to bend. Okay, so the first real solution of the equations of general relativity was found immediately after the formulation of general relativity by Einstein, which was done in 1915, by Carl, Carl Schwarzschild, who determined basically the, the solution of, uh, of these equations of general relativity, which were very complicated, but it basically determined how exactly a planet or as a matter of fact, a black hole, curves uh, space-time around it exactly, so the exact solution. This was a very important step. Unfortunately, Schwarzschild died uh, during the, the First World War, uh, immediately after formulating this, but uh, it, is a, it was a very big uh, breakthrough in the, in the theory of general relativity. In 1919, the British physicist uh, Arthur Eglinton, actually with, uh, with some uh, experiments, with, uh, with his experiments, uh, which, uh, with his equipment in Brazil during the total eclipse of 1919, he determined that Einstein's theory was correct. So he took the image of many stars and uh, with and without the sun, let's say, and he determined that basically there was a difference when the sun was there and when it was not there. So the light was bent by the, the, the presence of the sun and it was able to determine all the um, uh, angles, uh, the bent angles. angles. Uh, so basically it was able to, to confirm the validity, the predictions of general relativity. And after that, Einstein became a superstar uh, a world, st a world uh, star, basically, of physics. But it was because of Eddington that, uh, that he became famous. And so another prediction of general relativity is uh, uh, that uh, elliptical orbits are not elliptical. They're actually, um, they, they have a precession. 
Okay. So the ellipse rotates. The, this was uh, one of the predictions that was uh, also, it was known before Einstein thought about the general relativity. It's called the Mercury anomaly. But the general relativity actually predicts exactly the, the amount of this anomaly, which is not included in the, the old theory of, gravi of gravity by Newton. Okay, so the event horizon is, uh, imagine, I mean, every, every body, every, ma every planet has an escape velocity. For example, the escape velocity of Earth is 11 kilometer, kilometer per second, so it's very high. Uh, it's the velocity that it needs to, uh, for an object to, to leave the, the planet and to, to, to go to orbit. Okay, so the escape velocity uh, of Earth is 11 kilometer per second. If, what happens if the escape velocity of a planet or, or, or of a mass is equal to the speed of light? It means that not even light can escape, okay? This uh, uh, escape velocity, uh, when, when it is equal to the speed of light, generates a certain uh, radius, which is called the Schwarzschild radius. For example, for Earth, the Schwarzschild radius is, is just a few millimeters. It means that if all the mass of Earth is concentrated into uh, these few millimeters that you can see in the figure, then the, uh, this mass will become a black hole. Not, light cannot escape, okay? So this is called the Schwarzschild radius. At the center of the black hole, there is a singularity in which gravity, the force of gravity becomes infinite. And this radius, this surface is called the event horizon. So you, um, probably you've heard this many, many times elsewhere. Um, so the, the concept of, uh, of a black hole was conceived by Finkelstein in 1958, because before uh, it was known that uh, the escape velocity could be equal to the speed of light, but uh, it was not taken seriously, okay? So Finkelstein uh, conceived this, and uh, he actually thought that this could be a real possibility to form objects that trap light, okay? Masses that trap light, that not even light can escape. The gravity is so big, so high, that not even light can escape. These have been called black holes by Robert Dickey in the 60s. So it took many, many years before the, the, the actual realization that black holes could be a real possibility. Okay, and that the event horizon could be a real possibility, physical possibility. So mm, if you fall, the, the, the conventional wisdom is that if you fall into a black hole, you don't feel anything. You don't feel like you are passing this event horizon, okay? Nothing happens. It's called no drama principle. And also people say this, this, um, this sentence, black holes have no hair. It means that all black holes, with the same radius, they all look the same. They are absolutely identical. Black holes with the same parameters, the same mass, so the same radius, they all look the same. They are indistinguishable. People say black holes have no air. It's a, just a way of saying. So they are normal gravitational objects, but they have this special surface, which is called the event horizon. The event horizon can be, um, it, it is a kind of analog of a sink water falling into a sink, let's say, if the boat has a certain velocity, there is always a ring after which if the, if the boat falls, uh, let's say beyond this point, it cannot come back, okay? So this is an analogy that people use very often when, uh, when talking about the event horizon. But of course, we have, it has to do with light rather than uh, water, okay? But there is lots of analogies with water. If uh, you are very close to a black hole, your foot, your feet and your head, the, you have to be very close, but you can get arbitrarily close to the event horizon. Your, your head and your feet will, will, will feel a, so much uh, uh, difference in the distortion of space-time that you will see yourself like, uh, uh, like a spaghetti, elongated, okay? Uh, this is called the spaghettification. Uh, it is an extreme uh, uh, phenomenon that 
happens when you have small black holes. Okay, if you have a big black hole, you cannot see this. But if you have small black holes, this is very evident. And for a small black hole, the small black holes are much, much more dangerous than the, the very big black hole. Because a small black hole has huge tidal forces. So it will basically, you will die immediately as soon as you try to move sideways. Okay, while large black holes don't have very big tidal forces and you can fall uh, to the center. Uh, quite easily without dying until you reach, of course, the singularity in the center. Uh, I will shift this. So uh, the, the main uh, feature of uh, black hole is that this event horizon uh, protects the singularity. You can never see the singularity because the, the event horizon protects it because information cannot go from the singularity to the external part of the black hole. Because information travels at the speed of light, so it cannot reach you, cannot reach far from the black hole. So you can never see what's going on into a black hole unless you, you do the experiment and you fall into it, okay? So what happens when something falls into a black hole? The information is lost because the black hole is causally disconnected from our universe. The event horizon protects what's inside and you, you can never basically reach the outside. So if you throw some information, some computers, some books inside the black hole, this information is completely lost because, uh, because uh, it cannot come back. It causally disconnected from you, okay? And it is completely swallowed by the uh, by the black hole. So this would this this fact was recognized by Stephen Hawking to break the laws of quantum mechanics. The, in general, also to classical mechanics, to break the laws of physics because information is never information is never lost in physics. It may be it may be difficult to recover. Okay, so the information becomes so scrambled that it can be difficult to recover. But in physics, you never lose information. It's like um, a conservation of energy. Energy is never uh, destroyed or created. The same thing for information. Information normally is never created or destroyed. So the black hole seems to be an object that breaks this law. Okay, and this is very strange. And many physicists now think this is not true. Information is not destroyed. Why is that? So in 72, physicists called uh, Bekenstein, before the, the, the formulation of the Hawking radiation, um, paved the way for, for, uh, for the discovery by Hawking of the Hawking radiation. So the Hawking radiation is, suppose that you have the horizon of a black hole, lots of particles are created near the horizon the, of the black hole, Particles can be, one particle can be swallowed by the black hole, the other particle can be emitted, okay? Because the vacuum creates continuously particles. And uh, so black holes are not actually black. They emit a very faint light. It is impossible to, to observe because this light, this temperature, it's like a kind of hot body but the temperature of the, of the black hole is so small that it's impossible to see directly, okay? But physicists now are completely 100% convinced that if there is a black hole, this black hole is not completely black. It emits light. Uh, in general, it emits radiation, okay? And uh, this, this radiation is so important, theoretically so important, that uh, because it means that the black hole is actually not causally disconnected from the universe, the inside the black hole, because the black hole actually disappear after a while. So this is a star, it becomes a black hole and the black hole radiates, then it radiates so much that then it disappears, okay? And therefore all the information that the black hole has swallowed, it comes back to the universe Okay, after a, an extremely long time, pro probably infinite, but uh, in terms of human uh, scale, but uh, uh, in in a, in in a long time, it comes back to the universe to the universe. 
So it's not uh, it's not lost. Okay, so this is extremely important uh, phenomenon. The same kind of uh, analogous to Hawking radiation. So if you observe a black hole, it has this faint light, which is the Hawking radiation. But even if you imagine that you accelerate very, very, with a very large acceleration, of course, with, with an unbelievable acceleration, uh, you should see some radiation around you, which is called the Unruh radiation. Okay, which is, you see, there is equivalence principle. So an accelerated reference frame is equivalent to a gravitational field, the equivalence principle. So you could see all this radiation around you. And this radiation is, uh, is it, it appears because you, when you accelerate, you create around you an horizon. Although it might sound strange, when you accelerate, whenever you accelerate and you run, around you, you create an horizon. An horizon which is causally connected with you. But above this horizon, things are causally disconnected from you. OK? So um, there's no hope to see this radiation. But can we create black holes in particle ac accelerators? The answer is yes. In principle, yes. If you have particles, um, you can smash them together. And you could, in principle, uh, create black holes. Okay, inside the inside the accelerator, uh, micro black holes, not astronomical black holes. Now, the question is: Can are these black holes uh, dangerous? The answer is no, because small black holes emit a lot of Hawking radiation, very very fast. Okay, large black holes emit Hawking radiation that is very faint, but small black holes emit a lot of uh, Hawking radiation. So small black holes tend to disappear very quickly. And so they are not dangerous, even if you create them in, uh, in particle accelerators. Okay, so here I have a kind of animation showing two particles, the wave function of two particles colliding and forming a black hole. So in principle, you can do it. Uh, in the right conditions, but then they are not dangerous. They will not uh, swallow the... And the reason is Hawking radiation. Now, um, black holes have a unique property, one unique property, which is the following. And it's really weird. It's the weirdest thing, although, doesn't sound so weird when I, when you first hear it, but so what is entropy? Okay, so entropy is quantifies our ignorance of the constituents of a body. Now, entropy by non physicists, but also by physicists, by physicists, is one of the most uh, let's say misunderstood thing in physics. <laughs> Sometimes we, we 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 think about entropy like disorder. Okay, is a, a synonym for disorder, but it's not disorder. It's not. It's not uh, a synonym for disorder. Okay, so entropy is uh, quant it quantifies ignorance about a body. For example, take a cup of tea here in this figure. Okay, so the cup of tea is made of many atoms. Is made of many, you know, they're all moving and uh, they are uh, at a certain temperature uh, and different type of atoms and so on. We cannot track the motion of every atom. It's impossible, of course. So what we can observe is just its temperature, uh, its uh, fluid dynamics behavior. We cannot track anything about the about the atoms. Okay, so. The entropy of the cup of tea is proportional to the number of atoms, because we we the number of constituents of the cup of tea. Okay, so we are we are ignorant about each constituent, about the the trajectory of it of each atom, but actually, uh, the entropy is proportional to that. 
Okay, so the, the entropy is proportional to ignorance. It's a, quant it's a quantity that exactly quantifies the ignorance of the constituents of matter. So in the cup of tea, the entropy is proportional to the volume because the number of particles is proportional to the volume of the cup of tea. However, and this is true for any object in the universe, that entropy is proportional to volume. However, for a black hole, Bekenstein discovered that entropy is proportional to the area of the black hole and not its volume. So the black hole is the only object for which the entropy law is not valid. The entropy is not proportional to the volume of the black hole, but it's proportional to the area of the black hole. This is really weird. It's the only thing, it's the only object that, that, that it is known to behave in this way. Okay, so this is a kind of, it was kind of shocking and it is still shocking for, uh, for, for physicists. It means a simple thing that the constituents, whatever they are, the microscopic constituents of black holes are confined on the surface. So the volume of the black hole does not exist in a sense. It's a fake. The black hole has a dimension less than the, the, the rest of the universe around it. Okay? This is called the whole graphic principle. Okay, so the entropy of the black hole, the constituents of the black hole depends only on the surface and not the volume. There is nothing inside in a sense, if you want. Now, this is called the holographic principle. It's called a holographic because uh, it's like a kind of hologram. So this was discovered by, well, was postulated by Suskin and uh, Toft. It's still, still an open question, okay? But uh, it's, very, it's very nice because, you know, an hologram, you have two dimensional surface that then you illumin illuminate with a laser and then it creates an hologram, which gives you the impression to be three dimensional. So the holographic surface, contains the same information of the three-dimensional picture of the hologram, okay? So the two, thi the two things are indistinguishable. The hologram, which is in 3D, and the surface where all the information is encoded, they, they are the same. So they encode the same information, okay? So one is three-dimensional, the other one is two-dimensional in this example, in this figure here and they have exactly the same information. So you cannot know whether you live in a two-dimensional universe or a three-dimensional hologram. They it's, it's the same, okay? This is why it's called the holographic principle because the black hole has one dimension less of the rest of the universe, but perhaps it is our universe that it, it is an hologram of a lower dimensional thing. Okay, this is the holographic principle. I will not go further than this, explain this concept because it's really complicated and uh, it's not the point of this, uh, of this uh, freestyle lecture here. But I can tell you one thing, that the holographic principle is used by physicists for other reasons, for other completely different reasons. For example, you've, you, can, you, you probably know graphene. Graphene is a two-dimensional material that was uh, quite popular some time ago because it has very nice uh, optical and mechanical properties. Let me see the time here, yeah. Um, recently, some years ago, people started to uh, explore the properties of graphene through the holographic principle, okay? That it has nothing to do now with the real black holes, but they create mathematically a kind of artificial universe, a kind of um, toy universe, which contains a black hole, a curved space time and blah, blah, blah. And this artificial universe, uh, basically in one dimension less due to the holographic principle, this principle has exactly the same properties of graphene. So let's say that physicists have used this concept here of the holographic principle for other purposes using exactly the equations for gravity, but to describe T 
things that are not, that have nothing to do with gravity. For example, graphene. Okay, the properties of graphene. And to show you how incredible this thing is, on the top. Now it's it's not important here what are these plots. They 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 basically the, the, these these plots A and B. They it's they are measurements of a certain. Uh, quantity of uh, of graphene, which is called the conductivity. Okay, but uh, it, below in these two figures here are the figures that I have calculated by using the holographic principle, and this has not been done by me, but um, I've just reproduced these 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 plots. Okay, but I have calculated using the theory of gravity, Einstein theory of gravity. And you can see that the conductivity of graphene is described by a theory of gravity through the holographic principle. It's incredible. This is incredible. It's a quantitatively exact, uh, basically, uh, property of graphene. OK, so I just wanted to tell you a little bit about this holographic principle. And uh, another uh, thing that I want to, to talk about is wormholes. Uh, wormholes, uh, they're also called einstein rosen bridges. They're, they have, they appear very often in science fiction movies or, um, you know, in tales, uh, science fiction tales, uh, books, and so on. Uh, wormholes, the, the term wormhole has been uh, coined by John Wheeler, uh, the supervisor of, uh, of several famous physicists, including Richard Feynman. Um, wormholes connect two regions of space-time. Okay, it's kind of hole, that it's kind of tunnel that that connects regions uh, of space-time. So, two different regions of space, but also time. Okay, they can be different time as well. So it is, in a sense, also a time machine. Um, in three dimensions, I mean, in three dimensions, they would look like spheres. Okay, because this picture here is a two dimensional, but in three dimensions, they, they would look like spheres. A kind of sphere that if you go into it, you go into another place in space and time. Okay, this is how it would look like. This is also a computer simulation of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of a wormhole, uh, you know, in front of a building and uh, with some kind of uh, beach behind and so on. So the the thing about wormholes is that they are unstable. So they cannot exist. So this is a misconception by the general public that these wormholes can exist. Uh, they have been proved to be critically unstable. They need some special kind of matter to open up. So if you open up a wormhole, it closes down instantly. So they do not exist as far as we know. Of course, things can change during time, but as far as we know now from theory, they don't exist. However, they exist in other, in other, uh, in other uh, areas of physics, for example, in a swimming pool, in hydrodynamics. So you, you can see that uh, if you have two vortices, okay, they could be connected. So the vortices, in a, two, the two vortices, in a sense, they, they represent like black holes, okay? And uh, they can be connected by a rotating, a rotating thread, underwater thread, that is analogous to a, to a, a, a wormhole, okay? So this kind of thing exists. I've seen it personally when I was in Brazil years and years ago. I was in a pool, uh, in a children's pool, and I've seen this. And I could reproduce it many times with my hands. And um, so these are called phallaco solitons, but apart from their name, there are two vortices. They are rotating in different directions, and there is a thread. If you kill one of the vortices, it is recreated immediately. But if you kill the underwater thread, if you cut the underwater thread, the two vortices just disappear, okay? So this might give you the impression that, uh, that uh, yeah, they look like this. They look like black uh, spots uh, in the pool. 
and they all they're always in pair. And they last for like 15 minutes. They rotate for a long time. Okay, I've seen them. They're beautiful. This could give you the impression that the wormhole can exist also in uh, in space time, but space time is different. It's not water. Okay, it it is unstable in space time. Uh, yeah, basically this is. Um, uh, it can connect uh, different, uh, the wormhole connects different um, periods because uh, seen from an external observer, the two mouths of the wormhole experience different time flows because one lives in one space time, one lives in another space time, but um, in another point of space time, but seen inside of the wormhole, if you can ever open one, the two, mice, the two mouths of the wormhole don't move and you experience the same flow of time. So because this is because of relativity, relativity, different observers see different things. Okay, and sometimes also they contradict each other. Okay, this is a feature of relativity. Uh, another um, popular concept that you see very often is the concept of white hole. So they, they the opposite of the black hole. The black hole swallows everything. The white hole spits all the energy, okay? So this is also a concept that is very popular, but it's also apparently not, uh, not relevant. It's not true. The white hole does exist, in other words, in, conventional, in, in, in the conventional theory of gravity by Einstein, okay? Uh, actually, there was, uh, uh, Stephen Hawking proved a long time ago that a white hole and a black hole are indistinguishable. They are the same object, okay? So they cannot be, they can, the white hole is not something that spits out energy. And, uh, this is a misconception. A po very popular concept, of course. Um, yeah, so I think that uh, more or less my time uh, is pretty much up, right? Perhaps I you can go, you can go on a little bit more, yeah. yeah Don't worry, perhaps, yeah. Yeah, perhaps I I want to. I mean, this presentation is very long because I didn't intend to to present it all. But uh, uh, perhaps I I could um, I could tell you a little bit about strings. Okay. Cool. Yeah. String theory. String theory, because uh, as we said, okay, the the black hole degrees of freedom, so the black hole constituents all live in the surface of the black hole. But the real problem of physics now is what are these constituents? We don't know because um, uh, it, is, it, it can be anything. The entropy of the black hole just counts the constituent. For example, atoms. But you don't know exactly how an atom behaves. Okay, so in that case you need some other theory to know, the atomic physics, for example. You can count the number of constituents by calculating the entropy, and we can calculate the entropy. The entropy of a black hole is extraordinary. It's immense. When a star collapses and becomes a black hole, its entropy has a big jump. It, it's like it changes qualitatively when it, when it collapses and it becomes a black hole. So it, there is a qualitative change. It's called a phase transition. Okay, but uh, this qualitative change increases the number of constituents a lot. So people are asking themselves for, for a long time, for decades and decades, what are these constituents? So one of the main candidates of, uh, of describing black holes and in general, the universe and the forces in, in, in physics is string theory. There's too many particles in physics. It's called the particle zoo because there's so many. There is the particle that describes forces, for example, the Higgs boson, the gluons for the strong force, the photon for electromagnetic force, and the Z and W particles for the weak force. Then there are the particles of matter, quarks, up, charm, top, down, strange bottom, the whole kind of names that they invented because they didn't have any other name to to use the electron the muon the tauon the electron neutrino the electron mu, the um, uh, muonic neutrino the tauonic neutrino there's too much stuff okay P 
people feel uncomfortable with so much stuff, with so many particles. So the idea of the string theorist is in reality, there is no zoo in the sense there is only one object, the string, okay? The string uh, is, a, is a string, it's a one dimensional string made of energy. Okay, it's not made of, uh, of water, it, of matter. It's made of energy, of pure energy. Okay, and it has some many other properties. So the, it's like a, a violin string. Okay, the different way, the different frequencies, the different ways of vibration of an open string, for example, or a closed string, they represent the different particles that we see. For example, uh, uh, an electron, uh, a photon, and so on. But it's the same object. And this is much more, uh, let's say, acceptable than having many particles. Because in this case, you have just one object, the string, okay, that creates all the other particles. And this idea works. This idea works extremely well. So if each particle is, uh, is a different uh, realization of the string and gravity is due to oscillations of the closed string, okay? This is gravity, a closed string, the graviton, transmits graviton, gravity, okay? Like a photon transmits electromagnetic waves, okay? So this idea works very well. And, um, the, but there is one problem. When you include quantum mechanics, you need many more dimensions than four. So three dimensions of time and one of space, uh, three dimensions of space and one of time. You need 11. Oh, and in general, you need more, much more, many more. So the other dimensions, we don't see them. There are different types of expla explanations. The other dimensions, we don't see them because they are curved up. They are very, very small. We cannot see them, okay? And there is a, a special shape. In this figure, I represent, oh, it, they are represented by spheres, but uh, in reality, these shapes, can, they cannot be spheres. They are very complicated shapes, mathematically very complicated. They are called calabi yau varieties. Crazy, I mean, crazy mathematically. So this is why string theory is really, really difficult. Only a few people in the world can 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 study this uh, this bloody string theory. So people don't know where this is going or whether this is the real uh, theory of uh, everything and so on. But uh, the uh, there is a theory that is very interesting and it tells you basically something about gravity. In string theory, there are not just strings, but there can be also membranes. These are also objects that are, that are consistent with string theory, membranes. So like kind of a, a higher dimensional objects than the string. And the strings can be attached to these membranes only by them, their, their ends. So the, the ends of the string are, are attached, but they are free to move like in this figure, okay? So one end can be attached and the other end can be free to move and the, or the two ends can be attached to the membrane and so on. This membrane represent our universe and the end points of the string represent the particles that we see. This is called the brain model, the membrane model. It's very popular, okay? Makes a lot of sense also. Gravity, which is represented by closed string is weak. We perceive gravity as very weak because gravity is the weakest force of all. It's way, way weaker than the other forces, okay? Extremely, extremely weak. Although on human scale, we perceive it as very strong. It is way, way, way weaker than the other forces. So the reason why it is weaker is because it can escape the, the universe, the, the membrane. So this green, uh, this green uh, membrane represents our universe. All the endpoints of the strings that are attached, uh, they are our particles, the particles of matter, for example. 
But once in a while, the open string, the, sorry, the closed string, the circle here, which is uh, which does not have any endpoint, can interact with this uh, with our universe, and this is uh, why we feel that gravity is very weak because this open string just fluctuates away from our universe. So occasionally, just goes through, but it is not does not interact very strongly with our universe. So gravity is is perceived as a weak force. It's a very reasonable idea, although it's. Uh, uh, it's one of the main uh, models for for, uh, for string theory. So the Big Bang is in this model the collision between two of these universes, two of these pages of this big book. When they collide, this creates a Big Bang, and this is done periodically. Okay, this is the call the so-called brain cosmology. And in string theory, the black hole does not have a singularity. And the event horizon is a kind of fuzzy, OK? So in fact, uh, physicists have been able to calculate exactly the, the entropy of uh, specific types of black holes, which are called extremal. And it coincides with the, with the traditional entropy that we can calculate with general relativity or with uh, with mm, with thermodynamics. So it is very promising, but uh, the calculations of uh, other black holes have been proved impossible. So they're too difficult. So they can calculate only in very special conditions. So we don't know whether string theory is the real theory of nature or not. What we can say for sure, and with this I finish, is that. String theory requires an ingredient, which is called supersymmetry. For each particle that we know in nature, there is another, there must be another particle, which is the supersymmetric particle. So it's a kind of doubling of particles. Okay. Now we never see this. We never see this doubling because you would need too much energy. But by now, Particle accelerators were supposed to see this, okay, by smashing particles and created particles uh, with higher mass and higher energy. They were supposed to see the supersymmetric particles, like they like they were supposed to see the Higgs boson, which they did. Okay, maybe it took a while, but physicists were completely sure the Higgs boson was was real. Okay, it's just too many evidence, too much evidence. The same thing for supersymmetry is a lot of evidence. But up until now, there is absolutely no sign in particle accelerator, and the, phys the particle physicists are looking like crazy about this uh, uh, this supersymmetry because it would be a, a, a real confirmation of the validity of string theory. Okay, no supersymmetry. No string theory. Yeah, so I think it's time to, to end this talk because I, I, you know, include too much science fiction. Now, now I can assure you that everything that I, I discuss here, sometimes it is it has been simplistic, but it's uh, uh, basically they're all topics that are studied by physicists a lot. Okay. And uh, I am sorry for the technical problems that have been present at the beginning. I don't know what was going on. So it was some, some right. trouble there. Thank yeah. you so much. That was amazing. So well illustrated as well. And many more questions to come from this. <laughs> um, my heart I'm not sank sure a I little know the bit. <laughs> the, the wormhole thing. I, I thought there was like a slow, slight possibility. But um, there are other interesting things going on. So that catches up the fact that it's impossible. Um, yeah, thank you so much. And yeah, we're so sorry about the technical issue. Um, it's very much a learning curve, transferring our lectures to being online. So we um, are still learning, uh, but hopefully mm -hmm. it won't happen again. And we'll try our best to not have it again. And oh my gosh, well done on like staying serious and keeping going with the talk despite this. I was panicking, so <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well done. Yeah, I, it was a bit distracting, but I uh, tried yeah. to go on, to be honest. Uh, oh, real yeah. chat.
um and as well um as part of this of this lecture so please people um feel free to leave questions in the chat um uh, whether that be on youtube or on oh. facebook uh for dr fabio biancalana to answer yeah. um and just before that um as you know this is the talent hill lecture um, because of your amazing work um, in this field, uh, we would like to award you the Tannehill Medal. Uh, I don't know if uh, David can be seen on screen, but he has his little medal that he can show you at some point, hopefully, mm -hmm. and we can send it to you online. But if this were real life, I would be handing it to you, shaking your hand, and would have a picture taken mm -hmm. for, the, for the event. Um, Oh yeah, I don't know. Oh yeah, here's David. I don't know if you can see him. Yeah, we'll just leave him. Unfortunately, um, just, uh... wow, nice, amazing. We'll send it <laughs> to you. Um, <laughs> shame we can't give it to you live. Oh, okay. um, <laughs> However. However, we can take questions right now. I see we have a few uh, on YouTube, so I'll have a look right now and read them. Yeah, I, I can already try to answer one of the questions uh, from uh, Helen and Martin. Yeah. Uh, how do you demonstrate the wormholes in the pool? This is a very interesting question. Now, this, uh, this uh, wormhole is a called, it's called a soliton, okay? The, the technical term for this kind of things is soliton. What is a soliton? Now, the soliton was discovered in 1834 by a Scottish engineer, one of my legends, one of my idols, um, uh, Scott Russell, John Scott Russell. I mean, a super genius. Because in 1834, he was on the Union Canal with his... Uh, he was an engineer, so he was working on with some with the on the canal with some boats, and by mistake, a boat just fell into the water, and created the wave. Okay, but this wave was strange, because you know when you when you throw a, a, when you throw a, um, a rock, uh, a stone, into the into a lake, uh, you create waves like this. Okay, from the center you create waves uh, that propagate okay but this wave was not, was not the same type when the boat fell into the water the wave was very localized it was like a bump like a lump of water that was propagating forever this is called the soliton or the solitary wave now russell scott russell was was so shocked by this observation he start to follow with uh, with the, with his horse until this uh, until this wave dispersed but uh, this this way was not uh, slowing down or was not changing. This was so shocking for Scott Russell that he completely forgot about engineering and he started doing experiments in his house trying to reproduce this wave. Okay. Now, after many many years, we realize today that solitons are everywhere in all fields of physics. The black hole is a soliton. This kind of uh, wave here is a soliton. This, these vortices here is a soliton. It's called the Falaco soliton. Falaco. The Falaco soliton. It, it is just a name. Okay? In order to produce this soliton, it's very easy. It's very easy. With your hand or with a with, with a, with kind of shoe or with some kind of plate, you just immerse it very quickly into the water. Okay, this is what I was doing in Brazil when I had the chance of, uh, why, why I was doing it in Brazil in a children's pool, because you need dense water, dense water. And in, in the children's pool, the water is dense. Let, I don't want to explain why, but uh, uh, in that situation, if I submerge the plate quickly, you can see the formation of these, uh, of these uh, vortices immediately. They live for 10, 15 minutes before dying, okay? For a long time. This is a, a feature of solitons. The solitons are stationary solution of nonlinear equations. And the density of the water, the, 
viscosity of the water produces the conditions to create these, uh, these, these solitons, okay? Solitons are everywhere. Solitons are in, you can create with lasers. So my career, in my career, I've spent all, all my careers basically to study solitons in optical fibers, created by lasers in optical fibers. So the gravity, the gra my, the, let's say the black hole research is a kind of uh, analog of that research. So yeah, so it's a very interesting question. These, uh, these, uh, these pool stuff, these pool uh, solitons are created by, it's, it's an analog of black holes and uh, it's because the black hole itself is a soliton, which was a Scottish thing. <laughs> This is fascinating, but now I yeah. really want to learn about pool density as well. Um, didn't know uh, the that viscosity, was a thing. yeah, the viscosity, the viscosity. <laughs> I'll be looking into it. It's not appropriate. It's not uh, you know. It's not appropriate for uh, <laughs> for <a> YouTube <laughs> audience. Um, all right, we've got a question from John. Um, do you think that dark matter might also fit into the membrane theory, as it does not interact with matter, and so maybe it's a uh... thing? The same maybe dark matter, yeah. Dark matter could be the interaction of uh, so. Uh, let me go to the slide to the proper slide, okay? Um, you see this, uh, this brain cosmology, okay? There are many universes basically, they are the, like the pages in a book in the brain cosmology. So, the different universes, the different pages of the book they cannot talk to each other because the strings the strings are attached to the to these uh, membranes only by their ends the end points but uh, the, the only force that can go through the different uh, universes that can leave the page is gravity this is why we we perceive gravity as weak according to this theory, because gravity is kind of diluted through all the book, all the pages of the book, while all the other forces are stuck on a page, okay? And each page is, is a different universe. So the dark matter could be the gravitational interaction with another page, with another universe. In fact, in the dark matter uh, accumulates, accumulates uh, gravitationally around the galaxies, for example. And actually it allows the galaxies, the galaxies to, to exist, to rotate as they do, as discovered by Fritz Vicky uh, long time ago. But uh, so the dark matter, uh, the dark matter has a gravitational interaction. According to this theory is due to different universes and different pages of this big book uh, that is the multiverse. Uh, okay, uh, how does conservation of energy deal with the loss of one pair of virtual particles in the event horizon? Ah, very good, very good question. Yeah, let me explain. Oh, I didn't expect these good questions. Oh, Julian always has very complex and good questions. <laughs> let me see the, uh, the point, yeah. There is no um, conservation of energy. Okay, so one of the particles, this is not particle antiparticle, okay? So one of the particles has a negative energy, one of the particles has a positive energy. Okay, so the particle that escapes the black hole has a positive energy. In this case, this the red line here, the, the red arrow. The particle that is absorbed by the black hole has a negative energy. Now, since energy is equal mass, according to relativity, the black hole absorbs a particle of negative energy and it decreases its mass. It means that it, it, it has emitted energy. Okay, so the vacuum has zero energy. It can create pairs of particles, one with positive energy, one with negative energy. They are called virtual particles. However, normally, without the black hole, uh, normally you can never see these particles because if you observe these virtual particles, you are breaking 
the energy conservation uh, law. Instead, if there is an event horizon, one particle can escape and the other one can be absorbed. So you are not breaking the, the energy conservation law. The energy, the net energy is still zero, okay? The black hole is absorbing a particle of negative energy and therefore it is decreasing its mass. And it is emitting one particle of positive energy, which is the only thing we can observe from the outside. I don't know if that was clear. Yeah, uh -huh. does the particle crossing the event horizon always have negative energy? Yes, it does always have a negative energy. Great. Um, thank you. Thank you for that. And um, we've got another question from YouTube. Um, and it is, what is today a theory as revolutionary or potentially so as relativity? If there is such things, could it be string theory? Well, string theory has been revolutionary for a long time. The problem is there is not a single uh, experiment that confirms or disproves string theory. I have to say the truth. String theory looks very convincing, but uh, it's not, um, it has some strange things going on. Like for example, the multiple dimensions, the number of dimensions, the, there might be many, many dimensions because it is necessary to have these dimensions because all the hidden dimensions create all the properties that we see in our, in our uh, universe. For example, all the particles that we see, all the forces that we see, Okay, but uh, it's not necessary to have those many dimensions. And uh, there is not a single evidence of extra dimension. There is not a single evidence of supersymmetry, the symmetry that is necessary for string theory. So uh, we don't know, it's impossible. If uh, in the future, particle accelerators observe supersymmetry, uh, at least even one, one, even one particle that is supersymmetric to some particle that we already know, then uh, there is already very, very good evidence that string theory might be true. If there is no such observation of supersymmetry, then uh, it is impossible to conclude whether it is uh, true or not. There are other alternative theories. There is, for example, loop quantum gravity, which is very popular. I don't personally like it because it's very artificial, in which, uh, in which uh, basically space-time is kind of discrete, okay? And uh, there, are, there are other theories, uh, but um, yeah, string theory is the one that is mathematically and physically the most uh, reasonable, I would say. Sorry, what do you mean about space-time being discrete? So basically there is a, there is a, a theory uh, which says that there are um, uh, space time is not a continuum. Okay, you, usually you can uh, you, usually you, in what sense that you can go a small you know you can have arbitrarily small portions of space time or space on time or time. Okay, so there is a limit. This limit is called the Planck scale. There is a time and a Planck distance. They are extremely small. Okay, so the discrete the discrete theory of space time is that basically there are constituents like atoms or I, I don't know how to call them constituents of space time which are at the Planck scale, so small that are uh, in, invisible to the human eye, of course, and also to any instrument that we can have in, on Earth. Uh, but uh, they are discrete, and so they can. They, they, the space-time must be uh, described by a discrete theory, not a string or any other thing, but by points. Okay, discrete points. This is an approach that is shared by many different theories, including a theory that is popular. This is called loop quantum gravity, in which there are little loops of the discrete points in simple terms. Uh, and But they give you very similar prediction to string theory. Uh, for example, they can also calculate the entropy of black hole. Uh, you know, they give the same result. I found them a bit artificial, although I believe that theory, that the final theory is discrete, but uh, to be honest, it's all speculations. 
uh, there are many different uh, many different uh, approaches to to the final theory of gravity, the so-called quantum gravity. Okay. All right. Thank you for the specification. I mean, it makes it even more mind-boggling, actually. Um, but thank you for going further into this. Um, we've got a question yeah. uh, from YouTube again. How are giant black holes created? So I guess it, it's an interesting question between because there can be different sizes. So yeah. Giant black holes. Well, giant black holes are easily created by <laughs> astrophysical processes. For example, if you have a, a, a red giant star, mm -hmm. when it collapses and becomes a supernova, it can collapse into, you know, depending on its size, it could, it could collapse into, I don't know, uh, a normal uh, neutron star, or it can collapse into a black hole if there is large mass enough. Then the black hole starts to swallow things and it grows. Mm -hmm. When the black hole is very big, like for example the how it is called the M28 at the at the center of the uh, at the center of the galaxy of the, the Sagittarius uh, A. Oh, sorry. Sagittarius A. Sagittarius A. Yes, Sagittarius A. Very very big. Um, the larger the black hole, the less dangerous, because it is almost flat. And therefore, when you fall into it, you will die eventually because you will reach the singularity, but it will take a long time. And you can, uh, planets uh, can rotate. There can be planets rotating around the black hole, like, like around the sun, let's say, okay? There could even be life. Oh my gosh, it's like in the film Interstellar, no? Yeah, um... yeah, there could even be life. There is no, it's not excluded. <laughs> But uh, the thing is that if the black hole is small, there is so there are so um, uh, the tidal waves, the tidal uh, forces are so big that it's difficult to have life. It's destructive. So in it's a kind of strange because small black holes are more dangerous than big black holes for life. All right. Okay? So yeah. So small black holes uh, they distort space time too much. When, uh, when you go far from them. So the difference in the distortion of space-time becomes very dramatic uh, when you go close to them and, and when you move away from them. It, it, they create tidal forces that are enormous. While big black holes, they're almost flat and the tidal forces are small. So life can exist if, you, if there is a planet uh, orbiting around this. All right, and can these small black holes be really small even on a human scale? Um... Yeah, but they would be considered this. Um, if the black hole is if the black hole is small, it tends to shrink very quickly because of Hawking radiation. So um, I can't remember exactly what happens of, of, uh, to a, uh, what is the lifetime of a black hole uh, of the size of a human, but it it has to be of the order of seconds. Okay. So a few seconds and it disappears. And it, in a burst, in a kind of atomic bomb of radiation, because it's really, it's really powerful when the black hole is so small. Oh my gosh, that okay. sounds like magic. <laughs> so if you create a black hole in a particle accelerator, it, in principle, it is possible to deduce that you have created a black hole because it, it, it will burst into a lot of Hawking radiation, so a lot of particles, but from analyzing the, the emission, like the, exactly like they did for the Higgs boson, by analyzing the emission of this micro black hole, in principle, it is possible to deduce that there was a black hole there. But uh, yeah, All right. it is still uh, probably beyond uh, the LHC, but it's fully possible. All right, thank you. Um, how are you holding up? We have quite a few other questions. Yeah, um, it's okay. Are you good to have a few more? Good, um, thank you. So we have a question from John Leck. Uh, what happens when the brains, the pages, uh, touch each other? Can they touch each yeah. other? Yeah, yeah, they can. It is a big bang. So I can tell you this from what I remember that I studied a long time ago in, uh, when I studied string theory. Um, yeah, there is, a, there is a, a force between the different pages, the different pages. So... There is a force, okay? 
that can be calculated. And uh, this force uh, becomes enormous when, uh, when, the, when, the, when these pages are close to each other. And when they collide, this produces a big bang. It basically resets the whole matter that is, that is present in each page. Remember, the matter is made of strings in this model. So it is like a page with a lot of strings attached. The end points of the strings are the particles of matter. When this, when this, when these brains, when these membranes collide, they all the particles are reset, and this is the analogous of the Big Bang. So, yeah, this is uh, this collision happens to uh, you know uh, on, on time scale that are uh, enormous, of course. But this is a theory. Nobody says that this is true, okay? But there is a famous physicist, a famous female physicist, uh, Lisa Randall, who is an expert of this uh, um, uh, brain model. She invented all these kind of models. Uh, she's very famous. I think she's in right. Berkeley. Berkeley, yeah. Oh my God, there's so much to talk about, but so many questions coming in. So I'll just uh, skip <laughs> to the, the next question already. Sure. Uh, again, um, from Julian, uh, does the particle crossing the event horizon always have a uh, minus VE? Oof, that's not yeah, going to be the right way yeah. of saying it. Energy. Yeah, the particle crossing the event horizon that goes inside the event horizon uh, always has a negative energy. All right. Because uh, the uh, in order for the for uh, emitting a particle, to, you know, in order to emit a particle, the particle has to be emitted. Uh, away from the event horizon with a positive energy and therefore in order to conserve energy because this energy comes from vacuum a particle of negative energy must enter always the black hole seems strange but it's a it's a standard thing uh, in quantum field theory all right and um, we've got a question from steven what are the jets seen on some black holes does the mass of an object convert into a jet <laughs> The jet, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the black hole uh, accelerates uh, matter close to the speed of light around it. This is why, for example, you see all this stuff here. Okay, so matter is accelerated, uh, it's, it's, it's accelerated at the speed of light. This thing is, this thing is the plasma, is the plasma that is created by this matter orbitating almost at the speed of light around the black hole. It emits light, this plasma, a very, very powerful light. This is why a planet can, can orbit around the black hole and it can even receive light from this plasma. So life can, could exist in principle close to a black hole. Um, oh. Bit difficult, but um, it's possible. It's not excluded. Actually, I think there was a, uh, um, a lot of research recently on this. Uh, maybe Alistair knows much more about this uh, than me. Uh, but I, I've read about this uh, not long ago, about the possibility of having this golden uh, region, how is it called, uh, close to a black hole, to a massive black hole. Um, the film Interstellar was based on the research done on this very topic. Yeah, like uh, Kip Thorne. Kip Thorne uh, is one of the is probably the, the person behind this movie, or the physics of the, of the, the science of this movie. And uh, the simulations were done with uh, supercomputers uh, simulating the gravitational equation. The, the, the this these equations here. Einstein is writing on the board. Oh, oops, sorry. Yeah, these equations here that Einstein was writing on the board. And uh, yeah, so this is how this kind of picture is uh, is created. They have a computer. They need a supercomputer because the equations are short to write, but very very difficult to to solve numerically. There are specific supercomputers in Germany, in, in the U.S., in Edinburgh as well. There was a supercomputer doing this. Um, they simulate the equation of general relativity and they see how matter rotates around the black hole and they can generate these pictures here or the, the movies that show the collision of black holes and so on. So they look like jets, but they are, they are plasma that is trapped by the, in, in orbit by the black hole and, uh, and they emit a lot of light. The black holes can also have a charge and a magnetic field, okay? 
So the, the black hole can also have a charge. This is a different type of black, of black holes. And, and it's always spinning. The black hole is always spinning in reality. So it can spin it really fast. It has a magnetic field, did you say? Yeah, because the plasma, when it rotates, creates magnetic fields. Oh, right. All so right. it's a storm of magnetic fields. Uh, uh, like, like, it's quite standard, the thing that it's like current, you know, of electrons rotating almost at the speed of light. It creates magnetic fields. But okay. you have to consider this. The, the black hole, the black hole changes the space time around it. For example, I have, I think I have a picture at the end of the presentation that I, that I just put there for fun, but I thought I would never use it actually. So this is a kind of anatomy of a real black hole. The black, with the black hole, it distorts space time so much that you can see things be, you know, on the back of the black hole. Okay, so light uh, is like, uh, uh, you see this part here, this part here is actually the back of the black hole, the okay. far side. Things that you are not supposed to see, you can see because of the distortion of space time. Okay, also you see this ring here. This is the so-called photon ring. It is, uh, it is something that appears or after light goes around the black hole many, 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 many times. The, the 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 horizon actually is not this line here, but it's 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 inside. It's inside here. Okay, it's close. It's it's, it's a bit a little bit uh, more inside than 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 this ring here. Okay, it is it is not visible. You cannot distinguish the. You okay. cannot see the horizon. It's black. <laughs> Can this picture be found on the internet? Yeah, yeah. I found all this on the internet. It's uh, standard Ooh. things about... Uh, there are many lectures on uh, on YouTube that teach you, uh, you know, they, they show you every part of this black hole. It, seem, it seems a simple picture, okay? But it's mm -hmm. really complicated. It's really complicated to understand each part of this black hole. I mean, to think about the photo of the black hole that we got, it's just like one ring of fire. This is all Yeah, quite a bit because complex. that's not a picture. It's a, it's yeah. a kind of uh, image uh, imaging, okay? And it is already amazing that they got that, to be honest. Uh, but it will never, I mean, yeah, this is with the simulations are, uh, the simulations with the computers are now very precise. So we can trust this picture here. Like right. we can trust uh, the, the simulations uh, of the emission of gravitational waves and uh, the ring down of the gravitational waves this is amazing. That, that is also amazing. Uh, what I what I don't particularly like uh, about these gravitational waves is that people people always talk about the discovery of gravitational waves. Okay, I would call them observation of gravitational waves because gravitational waves have been you know, in a sense, uh, taught by Einstein. Mm. Einstein published the first paper on gravitational waves. Okay? So he discovered, in a sense, the existence of gravitational waves. They, of course, it was a huge effort to observe the gravitational waves. Sometimes you can hear the discovery of gravitational waves. Um, yeah, sorry about this, but I, I want to point out the importance of theoretical physicists in the, in the process. Then, of course, the, the, the experimentalists have done an amazing job, especially University of Glasgow. The University of Glasgow, there was a lot of people contributing, a lot of people contributing to... Uh, to, to the gravitational wave research at all levels, experimental, theoretical. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you for this little rant. Actually, I've taken note just in case because I do the social media for the society and I'm going to make a point of not calling it discovery. Don't know why I wrote so far, but that is a very good point. Um, all right. We've got, um, if you want, I'll take um, two more questions because it's getting quite late and you've been talking for quite a while. So I think you deserve a break. Uh, so I'll take two more questions. Okay. 
Yeah, I can see that Alistair actually pointed out several important things uh, in the chat, uh, you know, about uh, gravitational waves and things. He's the expert on this. Uh, oh, he is, yes. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm just, just giving some answers. Feel free to, to expand on them if you like. No, no, I can't expand on, uh, on your stuff. Uh. <laughs> um, well, thanks, Alistair, for that. Um, we've got a question from Alma on YouTube. Uh, didn't Stephen Hawking say at some point that he decided that the event horizon didn't actually exist and that he was wrong about it? Uh, you know, when physicists become old, they, they tend to say things that uh, they don't mean. <laughs> um, the, the event horizon does not exist in the sense that it is a mathematical construction, okay. okay? But maybe because it is not, uh, it is not, um, a, let's say, a physical uh, surface. Okay? okay, it is a it is a mathematical construction. If you pass that point, you can never come back to the normal universe. You are causally disconnected for a while until you become the, the Hawking radiation. You are destroyed by the, the singularity and become the Hawking radiation. But uh, yeah, Stephen Hawking, uh, Stephen Hawking uh, uh, in several times in his career did this uh, kind of things. For example, at the beginning of his career, he was completely polarizing all the community saying that information is lost when he come when he when he falls into black hole. So all the young people entering the you know the black hole research they were polarized by the opinion of Stephen Hawking. Formation is lost. That's it. And there was no space for other for other opinions. And uh, yeah, so slowly, also thanks to people like Leonard Susskind. Uh, people studying, you know, black holes on different point of views in string theory and other theories. Uh, opinions change. And now the, the main opinion is that the information is not lost. The Hawking radiation gives away at the at the end of the life at, of the lifetime of the black hole gives away the whole information that it, it has swallowed. Okay, through entanglement. It is a quantum phenomenon. Yeah, it's very complicated. Okay. I don't want to go into that because it's not part of this uh, kind of lectures. But uh, entanglement is crucial to Hawking radiation, and it creates a lot of paradoxes. Okay, quantum. Oh my gosh, it's a spooky action at a distance, isn't it? Yes, yes. Oh. So it is particularly so delicate for Hawking radiation because uh, uh, many people think that the laws of entanglement imply that the, there is a firewall around the black hole in the, at, at the horizon. So it's complicated. I don't want to go there because this is a completely different thing. But yeah, uh, Stephen Hawking uh, at one stage was, was saying that uh, the information is lost. Then he changed his mind and he polarized the community in the opposite way. And so, you know, the big scientists sometimes do this, and uh, it is uh, sometimes good, sometimes not. <laughs> All right. I don't want well, to. <laughs> that's good to know. I never heard it, of it that way before. That's so interesting. That would be a good topic for another talk, actually, as well. Um, we've got a question from Billy Russell, and I think it's in two parts. Uh, what's the relationship between space-time near a black hole event or horizon in the context of the holographic concept. And he says, I read time becomes spatial and space becomes time. Yeah, okay. Uh, the two different things. Uh, when you cross the horizon, mat mathematically at least, when you cross the horizon, the role of space and time invert each other. They are reversed. Space becomes time and time becomes space. This is said in simplistic way, yeah? But the horizon is the point where time freezes, time stops. In fact, there is this strange thing. If you, if you are uh, very far from a black hole 
and you send a spaceship, the spaceship can, can get arbitrarily close to the black hole from your point of view, from the point of view of somebody far from the black hole, but it can never quite reach it. When it, when it becomes uh, close to the black hole, it slows down enormously and it starts to wrap around the black hole. The image of the, of the spaceship will be distorted in such a way that it will wrap up the whole black hole, but it will never quite reach it because time stops when we see the, the spaceship from far, from far away, okay? But if you are on the spaceship and you are actually approaching the black hole, nothing happens for you. Time flows normally, you can cross the event horizon, you, you can die at the center of the black hole, okay? So this is a relativity. Two observers see the same phenomenon in two different ways. They are equally valid. Okay, because time and space flow differently and uh, space and time reverse their, uh, their role when you enter the black hole. Okay, which nobody knows what it means because <laughs> we, don't, we have no idea what's inside the black hole. Uh, stranger than fiction. <laughs> there, are, uh, there is, um, yeah, spinning black holes or black holes that have an electric charge they don't have one horizon, they have two, one external and one internal. So horizons can be of different types. There is not just uh, one type, okay? The, and I tell you another thing, the universe, what we call the observable universe, it could be infinite, we don't know. What we can see is the horizon of the universe. The horizon is where light can reach you or radiation can reach you. Beyond that horizon, we are causally disconnected for what, from what is outside. Exactly like, the, the, exactly like, it's exactly like a, the horizon of black hole, but on a cosmological scale. So what we call the size of the universe or the age of the universe, which is the same, it's actually the observable universe where the horizon is located, where the cosmological horizon is located. So it's not, uh, you know, it's uh, studying black holes and cosmology, uh, it's uh, they're related, of course. If you understand what's inside the black hole, probably you understand everything about the universe or much more about the universe itself. Nobody knows, of course, it's, uh, these questions are almost uh, superhuman to answer. Well, great, thank you for this last answer. It's truly nauseating actually, thinking about like such great scales. Um, but so good. Oh my gosh, thank you so much. It was so interesting. It's not just me saying that. We got so much amazing posit positive feedback. So many people showed up. Okay. But oh my gosh, like there's so many um, <laughs> comments saying how good you did. So thank well, you. Well, I don't know, so but uh, yeah, I I like to probably, you know, I like to give uh, to give uh, to give uh, the flavor of things. Of course, I, there is no pretense to be uh, you know, precise or uh, ex exhaustive in things. It's, it's just a way to stimulate uh, the imagination of people. And, in, you know, the people who are interested can read. They know that there are cer that they, certain topics exist and they can read about them uh, and, uh, and have a look later. Yeah, I think if you attend this lecture, if you're here, it means that you're really um, interested in learning and love educating yourself. So I'm sure everyone will just want exactly. to learn even more from your lecture and we'll have loads to research on. Like I, I've been taking notes, but I think I'm going to have to replay the video to see some things. <laughs> there, I was, I, I've, I've read so many things and been to a few lectures on this topic. And every time I learn new things, new crazy things. So <laughs> to keep up, you have to, to just do a bit of research. Um, but yes, it's so good. Yes. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined and for the lovely comments, for the great questions as well. It was so much fun. And um, I don't know about you, but in 2021, I want to keep learning more. So 
please feel free to join our free lectures every month. Um, I'll post the events on Facebook and on Twitter. Thank you so much, Fabio. It was great. Thank you very much to you for, uh, for the invitation. It was, uh, it was amazing and I'm very pleased that uh, so many people are interested in, uh, mm -hmm. in science and uh, in learning about you know, the universe and uh, these kind of things. So yeah, it's really good. I think it's David who found you. So thank you so much for making this happen. <laughs> Thanks very much, Fabio. Um, it's been a sort of common theme at, at the end of these um, virtual lectures that uh, we tend to think, well, we would like to have you back sometimes when things return to normal. You might want yes. to do Strathclyde, come through to Strathclyde and give a lecture in more personal um, circumstances. So maybe Yeah, yeah, why not? Why not? Future. It would be amazing. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Oh my gosh, I recommend it. It's so uh -huh. much fun. Uh -huh. I love going to the lectures in person and you meet so many people who have amazing yeah. questions. Um, and and uh, normally at this um, point of, uh, this was a, an actual meeting at Strathclyde, um, we would at this point be um, inviting you to join a few of us to go come along to the Millennium Hotel for an after lecture. I think we can have a couple of discussions. Yeah, yeah. We can do that. I have a special. Uh, I have a special relation with uh, with people in Strathclyde because my mm. when I was younger, the external examiner of my PhD, Professor William Firth, one of the most respected scientists in my field in optics and uh, solitons. Uh, he's from. He, he was. A, he's a professor in Strathclyde, so he's. A, uh, I know many people there, and uh, have a special relation with the mm -hmm. people there. Oh, fab. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. Really hoping we can have those live lectures soon. But this yeah, is great as well. Yeah. We got some comments there. Uh, there was someone yeah. from the U.S. So I think worldwide scope that we have now. So so good. Um. But thank you. I think we're going to end the live event um, soon. So it's not on um, YouTube anymore. Um, but thank you so much, everyone. And next month's talk, I think, is going to be by, by Robert Law, um, who was with us earlier. But um, he just left. But if, oh, he loves astronomy. Right. Mm -hmm. Such a he always has so many interesting things to say about it. So I no all things space. <laughs> yeah, he's just he knows everything. So I'm quite excited for that talk um as well. Um but yeah, thank you so much everyone. Uh and see you next okay. month. Yeah, thanks again, Laura, for, for tonight. An excellent job once again. <laughs> thanks. Thank you so much. Oh, it's so great. So many uh, people came. Wow. Well, I think it's 63 people at one stage. So I think that was the maximum we had. Wow. Yeah, we've got we lots of people to... on YouTube too. Mm -hmm.